about ah oh, these lovely ladies or whatever it was. And I looked up and there's Mark Daniels smiling. And I said, God, I did it. I got him to smile. This is the best thing I've ever done. Well, we should start off with the main reason why you are very kindly here for this interview. Uh, we are here to announce that you, Walter Koenig, are joining the Seventh Rule podcast with yes. Rock Lofton and Ryan T. Husk, and you're going to review yeah. episodes of Star Trek, the original series. That is amazing. <laughs> how? Tell me, how did this come about? Uh, you joining the Seventh Rule podcast. How, how did they talk you into this? It's the mail. They've gotten thousands upon thousands upon thousands of letters and they it was just to cease the mail the two postmen in in ryan's neighborhood have threatened to quit and uh as a consequence of lugging all this mail so ryan said well what can we do to keep the postman from quitting and um other than uh, firing this guy who's the head of the post office service which would be a good idea. Um, mm -hmm. uh, this is what they came up with. Now, <laughs> now, you joined Star Trek as Mr. Chekhov in season two. So you're not in the first 29 or 30 episodes, right? Will you, will you be rewatching and um, reviewing season one as well? No, I no. haven't. No, I haven't. I haven't watched. No, I, uh, in, in clicking my remote, my brand new remote that, you know, I was first, was using first, back in the 60s, uh, I came across Star Trek. I, I saw the styrofoam rocks and I said, forget about it. And I clicked off. So I didn't give it a chance. Will you be also reviewing season one, the episodes you're not in on, on the seventh rule? Will you be will you be uh, watching those episodes too? What do you want from me? It's, <laughs> it's not where I'm coming from. You understand what I'm saying? Maybe, maybe I'll do that. Okay. I don't know. Great. I don't know. Okay. Great. Awesome. awesome. Well, you know, on that note, there's something I actually always wanted to ask you. You know, in in Star Trek Two, right? You have that amazing scene where Khan puts the uh, the the, uh, the the eel in your ear. The eel. Um, yeah. Now Khan recognized Chekhov. He said, yes. "I never forget. He, I never forget a face." But you weren't right. in season one, and I read somewhere you you brazed this point while you were shooting the movie. You you, you pointed this out. Oh, and I was. I'm sorry, John. I was in Star Trek this first season. Chekhov was working in the boiler room. Oh. And he was so sick with a condition called Malapropsky's malady that he had he, he was in hidden in the bathroom and there for hours and hours, while poor Mr. Connor's genetically engineered kidneys about to explode, found it pitifully on the bathroom door, begging, begging to be let in until finally the door opened, Chekhov stepped out. Khan grabbed him and said, your face, I will never forget. That's the truth. So help me. <laughs> well, that explains everything. <laughs> you know, there, there's a, there was an interesting little anecdote that goes with the story, which is fairly fresh. That story is so old, God. It's got whiskers on top of whiskers. But I told this, a, a young man came up to me, couldn't be more than 20, 21 and said to me, he heard this story that I just recited to you. And uh, and he says, is it true? And I said, no, <laughs> no, it's not true. I made it up. And I said, my hand to God, John, he stared at me and said, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna consider it canon. <laughs> and he walked away. For him, it all happened. So who's me to too. say? Yeah, who? <laughs> there you go. A good story should just be canon. If, if it's a better yeah. explanation of what actually happened. Right. Um, so when was the last time you watched your old Star Trek episodes? Has it really been like decades? Or have you do you come across it every now and then and watch them? No. I did watch the Picard episode. Mm. Because my voice was on it. Um, and I thought it was a good episode. I thought it was well done. It was innovative. Uh, um, um, what's his name? Picard. Mm -hmm. What's his name? Picard? 
Yeah. Or are we talking? <laughs> what? Are we talking about the Pixar? actor? The actor. Oh, uh, you're talking about um, Patrick Stewart? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> He's a good actor. He's really mm -hmm. good. Uh, very dimensional and very layered. And uh, it was a pleasure watching him perform. I liked everybody else on the show, too. Todd, uh, who was on Picard, um, is my neighbor. We li literally li lived two blocks away. And we met walking I, my walking my dog when I still had one, uh, and I got to watch that episode of Picard at his house with Terry, the showrunner. So that was fun. Um, I don't know what it means and why I'm blabbering about it, but there it is. It was great. It was amazing to hear your voice and to hear um, Anton Chekhov, who I assume is Pavel's uh, son or grandson. Yes, part of that legacy. I met him. I met. Anton, oh, Yelts, uh, Anton Yeltsin, and mm -hmm. very bright, very delightful young man, very talented. My God, he's you know in the short time he had, he did several fold as many jobs as I ever had. You know, so you you got to uh, applaud his talent. Um, very very sad, very sad. Yeah, tragic. We lost him far too young. Mm -hmm. And you, 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 both of you are the only two people to ever play Pavel Chekhov, uh, at least in canon. Um, so it's still, it's a, it's oh. a, it's still a very rare thing to to be someone who played Chekhov. Okay. <laughs> well, well. So, um, do you have any favorite episodes of your old show? Does anything come to mind when you think about the old Star Trek? Yeah, yeah. The ones were generally where I went to the planet. Mm -hmm. uh, that meant I had some action. That meant that I was involved in the story to some degree. Uh, that they would probably actually, uh, the Chekhov would actually volunteer something uh, that was personal to him. You know, nothing deeply personal, but still in, invested him more as a character in the story. And that's what we all want as actors. We want to be, you know, thoroughly uh, a part of what's happening uh, so the audience can identify with us, so they can uh, they can root for us, they can imagine themselves playing those roles. Um, so yeah, when I went to the planet, Spectre of the Gun was my favorite. And it's one of those, it's one of those interesting little stories because you know it was sometimes the best things are by mistake you know or accident or in a, uh, uh, unintended if if, the, if there had been more money to shoot that episode it may not have been shot that way but because the network was complaining about the money we were, the star trek was spending they decided to make the whole episode about an illusion that it wasn't really happening. And if you knew it wasn't happening, then it wasn't real. So we could, we could, you know, it was like doing animation. Uh, mm. you, you could do so much more because it's animation. Well, if it's an illusion, you can have any kind of preposterous incident or occasion. And, and then in the end say, oh, well, it didn't really happen. It was, you know, it was in our minds. And that's what happened there. The premise being, that if you didn't believe that the um, gunfight of the OK Corral was about to happen, then it didn't. But if you believed it, then it was. Of course, the only, the only, um, the only uh, thing that has to be acknowledged is that if we didn't believe, if if we, if we believed it, which we did until uh, to a point. Then when Chekhov is shot, he ain't coming back because we don't know then at that point that it's an illusion. Mm. And uh, I I went to the editor. I don't know what self-destructive impulse capt captured me, but I went to the editor and I said, you guys know that Chekhov can't come back from the dead because he didn't know that it was an illusion. And I waited for them to give me some uh, explanation that would appease me, would 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 uh, 
not uh, not offend my sense of logic um, and story structure, but at the same time be acceptable so that I could come back the next week and say, what effect there to kept it? And the editor's uh, response was, yeah, we thought about it. We said, screw it. <laughs> <laughs> so they just, they just didn't really deal with it, you know. What they said was that they added, it was an addendum. And this is something that a lot of people might not know because I didn't know. Evidently, they have Chekhov saying, the only thing that was real to him was the girl. It's nonsense. It's, how can one thing be real to him and the other thing not be? You know. Hmm. So, but that's what that's the way they explain why Chekhov was still alive at the end. So that's an interesting thing you didn't know before. No, I and actually didn't. Too, John, John, you didn't know it. And I'm very surprised, a little disappointed, a little disillusioned that you didn't know that. <laughs> I'm here to be enlightened by you, sir. Yes. <laughs> was that um was that your favorite performance as Chekhov? Is there another scene that you're that you're proudest of? That I'm proud you know, of myself. You know, a performance as Chekhov that you're proud of. Uh, something that you you did that that sticks out in your mind. I don't know. You know, we had two directors. We mm -hmm. had Mark Daniels and we had uh, Joe Pevney. Joe Pevney in the in the second season. Joe Pevney directed a uh, series of the Alfred Hitchcock Hour that I did a guest lead in, opposite James Kahn, who I went to school with, Jimmy right. and I. He was the good guy. I was the bad guy. Joe Pevney kept telling me I was going to be great. I was going to be a star. He kept telling me that. It was, it was nice to hear. I didn't really believe it, but it was nice to hear. So what do you know? I come in for the audition. There's Joe Pevney. You know, and I thought, well, mm -hmm. this helps. This definitely helps. But Mark Daniels was there. And from the most from the first moment I met Mark Daniels, very uh, appeared to me, and I emphasize, I underscore this, a sour disposition. That was my in initial reaction. Um, inaccurate, by the way, but that was my and when we started shooting the shows, never got a got a smile out of it. And in several of the episodes, there was an attempt to give Chekhov something light to do. Oh, yeah, it was invented by a little old lady from Leningrad, or something, <laughs> you know. And uh, and Mark Daniels never smiled. So I think he hates me, you know, actor. Big, big letters. Neurotic. <laughs> Insecure. <laughs> um, but then we did I Mud. And I had a line, I don't remember what it was. Uh, I'm sit, I'm lying back and I say something wistful about ah oh, these lovely ladies or whatever it was. And I looked up and there's Mark Daniels smiling. And I say, God, I did it. I got him to smile. This is the best thing I've ever done. <laughs> 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 What's, so what a, that's my answer that's an amazing answer what are, yeah. one of my favorite moments that you played as Chekhov was actually uh, Star Trek 4 when you had to go to the hospital and you were being wheeled around the hospital and the whole time you were you were think you were dreaming yourself as, as Captain as Captain Pavel Chekhov which I, I just I love that I thought the comedy on that movie was so great you were all at it the was, top of your game it was, be, my, it was my best film that I enjoyed the most I thought it was also, the, the best ensemble work. Uh, uh, um, Nick Meyer made a concerted effort to involve everybody. It's everybody. Uh, unfortunately, George got screwed because the sun went down and we had a very recalcitrant little kid who wouldn't play opposite him the way he was supposed to. George had a lovely scene, one, by the way, that I uh, invented for him. I told him how it should work, yeah. but. Um, it was um, not that, you know, I and mean, he would have done it beautifully, but we, the kid wouldn't do it. He wouldn't do it. And then finally, we, we were going to get his brother to do it, who was older. And as soon as he saw that his brother was going to do it, he says, OK, I'll do it. At which point the sun was down and we never got back to shooting it. But, um, yeah, I, I thought uh, the, the scene, the, the scene in, in, the, 
in the truck between Leonard and Bill, it was classic. It mm -hmm. was just classic. It was so well done. Uh, you know, great, a great couple, you know, to, to work a comedy scene on um, bouncing off of each other. So, uh, and then it was an important story. It was an important story. It was, we were getting back to what Star Trek was su supposedly inspired Star Trek to begin with, you know, humanitarian issues, civic issues, um, the environment. Uh, it was, uh, it was a message story, but told so well that you never felt burdened by the message that you, you just felt receptive to it. And, uh, so in, in, in my estimation, for what it's worth, it's probably worth nothing. And I thought that was the best of the Star Trek shows that we did. I would say it's definitely up there. It, it is at least one of the most enjoyable films. It's, um, it's probably the most entertaining, flat out, straight through. Um, it, it is a joy to watch. It's still one of my all-time favorites. Good. I wasn't talking about the other series. I'm just talking about Star Trek. Of course. Our Star Trek. Okay. Of course. I haven't seen the other series. Pavel Chekhov's story was never really finished. Um, like I, you played, I know you played Chekhov in fan projects like Star Trek Renegades. And, but in terms of official canon, Generations was the last time you played Pavel um, in a film. Yeah. Yeah. So I know you're also a writer. Like, how do you, how do you end Chekhov's story? Have you ever thought about like what really happened to him? How, how his life turned out? It's actually a very good question. It's a very pertinent question because um, when I got the script for Star Trek VI, I was desperately disappointed. I thought that each of us, Michelle, George, Jimmy, and myself, each should have a personal moment as the character. You get to know how they respond, how they deal with crises with emotional situations, not with life and death. Life and death is easy. What's going on inside? How are you? How do you evaluate this circumstance? How does it reflect on you? How do you, how do you reflect on it? Who are these people? Who are these people really? Not just that they are a composite group who, you know, it's good. It's it's certainly commendable that they are different nationalities, different races. Uh, that's commendable, and that they can get along together. But that's that's almost by intimation. It's not by discourse. It's not by communication. We don't see them put into a conflict in a situation where they have to either, you know, what if. What if, um, what if uh, Scotty had to save Uhura or, or Chekhov mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and there is some question about why he might not save Uhura. I mean, that's never going to happen on our show, but if, it, if there was, if there was a racial question and he does it anyway. And then you get to see how he deals with these kind of conflicts. And you see, oh, that's the kind of guy he is. When a push comes to shove, he's there. He's there for you. And you get to see what he is. That's the kind of insight that I would have loved for these secondary characters to have had, that you could really root for them. You know, Bill Shatner made a very, very um, um, accurate comment. At the time, it it felt it felt kind of mean spirited, but he's absolutely right. He was absolutely right. We were secondary characters. We were subordinate characters. We were at the end of the episode title characters, you know. And if we had not gone out on the road, if we had not gone to conventions where eight thousand people piled in to a hotel in New York, if we hadn't realized. Or, or the audience hadn't realized how much they cared for us, and they did in the exchange of ideas between themselves, then we would never have realized that we were important to the show. Or maybe we weren't until they gave us the stamp of approval. But once we got the stamp of approval, we thought we deserved more. Mm -hmm. 
And we're actors. We all think we deserve more. You know, and in, in our case, they're all talented people. And they did deserve more. But the audience gave us the hint. They said, you guys are better than just that. And so we started complaining. And we, so we uh, took some exception to the way we were dealt with. Um, but it was disproportionate to our contribution to the show. You know, it was it was expositional. We gave you plot lines. We didn't give you how we were dealing with, with situations, how much we hurt, how much we rejoiced, how much we cared for each other, what sacrifices we would make. Those things were not the part of the the other actress. And then and they and I'm you know, looking at the picture of them all. And and the audience has so come to love them. I mean, when the forest was alive, he was grandpa, you know, to a lot of act to a lot of fans. Jimmy became uncle, and I I remember I remember how much they they loved Jimmy, you know. And so it goes with Michelle and George. So we we gave them. The gift of our of our un, 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 uh, unadulterated, undiluted joy and enthusiasm, and having given them that, then uh, the people who created Star Trek had to acknowledge that to some degree and make these the subordinate characters a little bit more important than they were. They still could have done more. They all. I think Jimmy is a wonderful actor. I don't think you got to see him as good as he as he is, or was a very versatile actor. Um, so if he had been given that, I mean, got to. No, 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 I rushed to do this because I almost forgot. And and shame, shame. Got to acknowledge the writers. The writers are the ones who who dimensionalized the characters as much as they were dimensionalized. They made it possible to us to breathe. And um and they're you know super important to the whole con concept of, of Star Trek. Um writers frequently do not get the the recognition they deserve. Anyway, I'm just rambling. God almighty, that's what happens when you turn 87 years old. <laughs> No, sir, you have amazing points to make. You know, your show, if we, if your show were made today, your characters would all have storylines and be Absolutely. fully fleshed out. That's what they're doing now in the current show. Strange New Worlds, for instance, every character is fully sure. realized. So, yeah, it is, it, it is, a, it is a shame that Chekhov, uh, Sulu, Uhura didn't quite get that back in the 60s and or even in the films as you pointed out in Star Trek 6 because John that's very true but also you know the times are changing you know and you have to look at things from the perspective of when they occur now you know how many people read for Chekhov a part that is known I mean I've been to Russia I'm to a fan convention in Russia people all over the world two people read for, for Chekhov me and another guy uh, it wouldn't happen today. Today, they you have to come in seven, eight, nine times, you know, um, it, because they know that the significance of those roles, and they know they're going to have an effect, and that the and and and, and a universal audience is going to um, be there to embrace them. Uh, and that you know, when the when we did it in the sixties, he was just a character after the. After the credits, he, you know, he wasn't one of the stars. So there's that to be said as well, you know. And I got to, I got to be involved with this whole thing for all these years, um, uh, and and have so little competition to get the part. How many other actors do you think would have done it or done it better? Hundreds. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know they could. I, I, I think I'm a good actor. I'm a good actor, but you know, I don't stand on the mountaintop. So, um, anyway, 